All right, we're back. I'm here on my lanai again, not in my classroom for the next few days. So, and we're, we're here back from fall break and ready to get back into the swing of things. So hopefully you're all with me and you're ready to say that you are here. Remember how it goes? Good morning, first grade, are you here? And you would stand up and say, yes, Mr. Coulter, we are here. Good morning, dear first grade. Let's do the morning verse. So standing up, reaching your arms up to the sky where the sun is and say, the sun with loving light makes bright for me each day. The soul, the heart with sacred power Give strength unto my limbs. In sunlight shining clear, I am reverent. The strength of humankind has so graciously been planted in my soul that I with all my might may love to work and learn. Toward us comes light and strength. From us rise love and thanks. All right. Um, I have a new song for the Halloween season. It goes like this. Someone came knocking at my wee small door. Someone came knocking, I'm sure, sure, sure. I opened, I listened, I looked from left to right. Not a creature was stirring in the still dark night. All right, I'll sing it one more time and maybe you can, you can chime in with me. Someone came knocking at my wee small door. Someone came knocking, I'm sure, sure, sure. I opened, I listened, I looked from left to right. Not a creature was stirring in the still dark night. Is that a little bit spooky? Hmm, someone was knocking and no one was there. song. I don't know if you heard that. I was whispering. <laughs> Spooky kind of a song because no one was there when, say, when someone knocked. All right. And now I have a poem for the, for the Halloween season that goes like this. Five little pumpkins sitting on a gate. The first one said, my, it's getting late. The second one said, there's a chill in the air. The third one said, but we don't care. The fourth one said, let's run and run and run. The fifth one said, I'm ready for some fun. Ooh, came the wind and out went the lights and five little pumpkins rolled out of sight. So I wrote the words to that and the other one on the website. You can look it up and see them written if your parent wants to read them to you or whoever your grown-up is, whether they're your parent or somebody else. Doesn't really matter, does it? All right. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to count backwards from 100. So we've been practicing counting forwards to 100, and now I want to count backward. And it's maybe a little easier than it sounds, especially if you use your fingers. So we'll start with 100. Actually, let's, let's count up by tens and then back by tens and then we'll start at 100 and count back by ones. So when we count by tens, we just say 10 and then we say 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. And now backwards, 100, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, and back to zero. Now when we count from 100 backwards by ones, don't worry because even if you don't know how to count forward by ones, you can learn to count backward by ones. It'll start to make sense. If you can say 10, let's count backwards from 10 by one. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, two, one, zero. And we can do it. Um, let's just go on. So 100, 99, show me nine fingers. 98, show me eight fingers. 97, 
96, 95, 94, 93, 92, 91, 90. A, uh, 90, so now, we have, now we're back to 90, so we go 89, 88, 87, show me seven fingers, 86, 85, 84, 83, 82, 81, 80, 79, 78, 77, 76, 75, 74, 73, 72, 71, 70, 69, 68, 67, 66, 65, 64, 63, 62, 61, 60, 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, blast off. All right, so now we have to do the day and the date because we did not do that yet. Today is Monday. October. Finally, not September anymore. 30 days had September, and we've already gotten oops, 12 days into October. So we get back to the classroom, we'll fix up our calendar, but of course it's still the year 2020, and will be for a few more months. Today is Monday, tomorrow is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, back to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, back to Monday. In Espanol, lunes, martes, miércoles, Jueves, viernes, sábado, domingo. I can't do it in Spanish as fast as I can in English. Uh, one more time in Spanish. Lunes, martes, miércoles, jueves, viernes, sábado, domingo. Okay. October is the month in which Halloween takes place. So that, I'm looking forward to that. I think it will be fun to uh, have some costumes. We'll have to figure out what we're going to do these days. Um, for Halloween celebrations when things are just so different in the world these days. All right, so I want to do new shoes next. I want to remember that one because we've left it for a long time. I'll point that at my feet so you can see. New, are you ready? New shoes, new shoes. Jump, red and brown and blue shoes. Hard part, flat shoes and flat Fat shoes and flat shoes, fat shoes and flat shoes, and stomp around like that. Shoes up on your tiptoes. Which shoes shall I choose? One more time. New shoes, new shoes. Red, cross, brown, and blue shoes. Fat shoes and flat shoes, and stomp around like that. Shoes. Which shoes shall I choose? 
All right, I also wrote that down on the website so that you can see it, to read it, someone can read it to you. All right, now I would like to practice um, form drawing. So this form drawing is almost the same as the last form drawing. And I will uh, show it to you first, but don't do it yet. But you will need your chalkboard. So it's almost the same. Pretty much is the same, except one thing is a little different. That takes some concentration, and you can see this one's a little bit low, and you know there's a lot of little differences in them. Uh, this one's a little skinnier than that one. I try to make them the same a whole way, but you know couldn't quite do it. That's okay. Go bring this camera a little closer for this. And then the difference is, this time. I'm going to start here, or I could start here inside, but I'm going to start here outside, and I'm going to go up into each one. Whoops. Okay, so that was kind of my practice one, and now, as you can see, I've made a little bit of a maze, which is kind of fun. make my way all the way through there. All right, so now I'm gonna teach you how to do it. And the first thing I like to do whenever I'm practicing something, of course it's nice to have a chalkboard, but I like to do it with my finger too. Just go up and down, up and down, up and down. That's easier, isn't it? It's easier to make this shape with your finger than it is to do it with a pencil and paper or a chalkboard and some chalk. And then, so that was the this one, and then we can start upside down and make this shape instead. That one reminds me of waves. So this one is mountains, mountains, or hills. Hills, tall hills right next to each other. And then waves. So if you practice that a few times, sometimes I even like to practice that shape with my foot could draw that shape in the sand with my toe. I could make it with my elbow, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. That's kind of fun. And then when we do it again, I'll do it now. And you can practice this on your chalkboard, and tomorrow we'll put it in the main lesson book. So I'm going to try and do it my best. But my best try, it's just my best try. I honestly don't care how well you do it. Can you believe it? I'm your teacher, and I, in a certain way, I don't care. I don't care so much how well you do it. What do I care about most, do you think? I care about how hard you try, and that you forgive yourself if you don't make it right. That's what I care about most. If you get frustrated, that's OK. Just try again. That's what I really want to teach you, is how to try things that are hard and try them again when you get frustrated, okay? So, just a form drawing after all. Here we go. So I'm going to start, I think I'll start, I'm going to aim for the middle this time. I'm going to aim for the middle. So this is the top, this is the bottom. I'll use a different color. There's the bottom, there's the top. Right in the middle there, in between those two, halfway up. I'm going to call that the, my starting point, halfway up this line that ends right there, so right about in there. Okay, so I'm going to start, I think I will use a different color, maybe it'll be easier for you to see. Start here, and I'm going to go halfway up. This is the hard part. The hard part is coming down and planning when to go up.
All right. Oh, that one's a little too high. That's okay. Just doing my best. I'm going to get a different color, and I'm going to do the maze part. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to end over here. If you were doing this with pencils or colored pencils or crayons, it's okay. They can all be the same color if you want, although it's a little harder to see, especially when you do this last part. Here's the maze. I'm going to try to go, and again, I'm going to, oh, I didn't even think of this till just now. I'm going to try to stay right in the middle. Try not to bump into the, the edges. I'm going to try to stay right in the middle, even when they come farther apart or closer together. I'm going to just aim for the middle, like a little race car going down its track, or a little mouse winding his way through a tunnel. There. Done. So you can practice that uh, maybe one more time sometime today, perhaps, and um, then tomorrow we'll put it in our main lesson book. Try to do our very best work in our main lesson book so that it is like a prize possession, something that you love and care for the rest of your life, <laughs> or at least for a long time. Um, and that you can show other people that all your good work in the first grade. So we have lots of scratch paper and lots of other stuff, but in the main lesson book, one page at a time, using the front and the back. I know we're not in school, so I couldn't help you figure that out. And um, we try never to start over. We try never to just give up, and we try never, never, never to rip a page out. Every once in a while, we simply have to. But if there's something on the other side, then we can't. So try just to start in yellow and you do your drawings and then um, just do your best. Just cover up what didn't work out. It's better to have a, just a good record of what you did and just always do your best in your main lesson book and take care of it really well. That's the idea there. All right, so um, the next thing I would like to do is I would like to tell you that today is um, a holiday in some places. And today is uh, two different holidays, in fact. So today is uh, Columbus Day, um, and we study all the explorers of the world later on in the, much later in the, in the school, in, the, in seventh grade, I think it is. And we study them really well, learn all about them. Learn about the uh, Polynesians who discovered Hawaii uh, through watching the stars and the currents and learning how to wayfind find their way over thousands of miles of ocean. Just unbelievable how, how amazing that is that they could do that. And, um, and also, um, explorers from, came from other places and didn't even know that some parts of the world existed. Captain Cook, for instance, came to Hawaii. No one in the whole wide world except for the Polynesians. So nobody in all the world, the civilizations, far away in Europe and all over the Middle East and all over Asia and China and Japan and all these places, they had no idea that um, Hawaii existed. And they didn't even know that North America existed. The people in North America, of course, knew it existed, just like the people who lived in Hawaii. They knew it existed, of course, because they lived there. But the world was a different place, no telephones and cameras and no way of knowing what was going on in other places and the, the ocean was so big that no one had ever been across it to find out what was on the other side. They only knew the places that others had traveled and mostly they only knew of course from, from drawings that people made and writing that people wrote about faraway places and some, some of them didn't even know that those, some of them didn't even believe that those places existed. Anyway, so today is Columbus Day, also Indigenous Peoples Day. Indigenous means the people who lived there first, the people who inhabited an area and lived there, the first ones to live there, the native people. So Indigenous Peoples Day was uh, created partly to uh, acknowledge that the, the Native American people who lived in North America, where uh, some of us came from, 
California and New York and everywhere in between, um, the, the native people, the Indians that lived there, um, that still live there, of course, just like Hawaiian people still live in Hawaii, all the amazing contributions. Like these days, we like to talk about how the, the canoe plants were brought here and, um, and how the other animals that were brought here and the culture that was brought here from the islands far to the south, Polynesia and other places, all around Micronesia and all the places like that. All those explorers that explored all those islands that finally came way off to Hawaii, the farthest away island anyone had ever been to. Um, so we, we like to celebrate the canoe plants and other things that, um, that the native people brought here, like sustainability, ability to provide food on this island, because of course there was no uh, ships coming from anywhere else. You couldn't get any food here. Um, but huge population of people lived here. You know, and uh, they provided for themselves, of course, from the ocean and all the fish in the ocean and from the land. And they grew all these plants, of course, and survived just very well on them, according to the history that I have learned, at least. So I have a story for you today. And the story is from um, a faraway island far to the south. And it's a story called Hina. And of course, Hina is a familiar word to us here in Hawaii. Hina and the wooden bird. So Hina lived in her little island community far away from here, far down to the south. And uh, this was a, a story that the people there tell. Um, I can't remember the name of the place. I had not heard of the place. Um, it's a little island way down, far away from here. Um, this is a story from that place. So Hina was a little girl who was born with only one leg. She, uh, she, her, her job when she was little is to take care of the family's sleeping mats. And every morning, she took the mats outside and laid them out in the sun to air out. And her brother sometimes helped her. So, and she, even though she had only one leg, she could do her job just fine. She learned how to, how to get along with only one leg, just like we get along with only two legs and <laughs> don't have to have four like an like some of the running animals that we see all around. Um, so, but this day she was tired and after she brought the mats out to lay out in the sun, she went back inside the hut and lay down for a nap. And she and her brother slept. And they were so sleepy and slept so soundly that they did not hear when the rain started. The rain god's littlest child was learning how to make rain. The rain god's littlest child was sprinkling water down on the land below. And the rain god said, oh, very nicely done. Very well done, little one. And then, <coughs> then the rain god said, but little Hina, she is not waking up. Let's call your older sister and let's have her a little bit more rain. And little Hina will wake up and get those mats inside because they will get all wet if she doesn't bring them in. So. The, little, the bigger sister, she came and sprinkled some more water and she made it rain harder and harder. And then the rain gods, oh, he little Hina and her brother still asleep. You have to wake them up. Let's rain so hard that they will definitely wake up. Get to work, all you kids. So all the children are out there, the rain gods' children, shaking water down on the land, making it rain harder and harder. Harder, the rain god said. Harder, harder, rain harder. Wake them up! They're raining harder and harder and harder. Finally, the rain god said, Ah, I can't believe this. They're still asleep, those little ones. Okay, I'm gonna rain so hard. They've never seen such a rain. And the rain god made so much rain, the flooding was happening. And guess what? Finally, they woke up. But Hina had been sleeping, dreaming. She was swimming through the ocean and just had a water dream, but didn't realize it was real. So finally, she woke up. Oh no, she went outside. Oh no, the mats have been swept away, most of them. What are we gonna do? All of our things swept away. And she thought, oh no, but the, the rain had finally cleared and the sky became sunny again. And she went outside, oh no, oh no. And she and her brother pulling the mats, the last ones back inside. And 
She knew her parents would be very angry. Sure enough, her parents came home. What's the matter with you? How could you let our things get swept away? Look at our mats and even our special mat that has our wrapped up our special magical shark's teeth. That is gone too. Little girl, you must go out and take care of your mess. Go outside and search until you find all of our things. Take responsibility. So Hina knew she had no choice and she made her way even though only one leg down to the ocean because she knew that's where all the things get washed. And she went out into the ocean and started swimming around, floating around. First she saw a shark coming by. She said, oh shark, are you the one who has come to take me to look for my things of my family? No, the shark said, not I. And then a little tiny fish came by and Hina said, are you the one who is coming to get me to take me to find our things? How could I do such a thing, said the little fish? I am too tiny. Then along came a parrot fish. She asked the same thing and got the same answer. No, said the parrot fish. How could I bring you out into the ocean and look for you? But then along came a sea turtle. The sea turtle came and said, yes, it is I. Hold on to my shell. Hold tight no matter what, and we will go searching. And so they went out far out into the ocean with Hina holding on to the turtle's shell. After a long time, the girl said, Oh, I am thirsty. And she saw coconuts floating in the water, a coconut. And the fish said, Ah, there's no problem. Get, rip it open with your teeth, the coconut, and then I will crack the nut for you so that you can drink the sweet milk. Well, she did as she was told and was successful, except she wanted to do it herself. And so she took the coconut and cracked it on the turtle's head. Oh, the turtle was so angry. Don't you know it's taboo to touch my head? You can't touch my head. Besides, you hurt me on the head, and I told you not to do it that way. So the turtle, in anger, flipped Hina off his back and dove down, 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 down into the deep water. Well, Hina swam for a while, but became more and more tired. And after a while, finally, she thought she was going to drown, and she let herself in her exhaustion sink down under the water. Just in time, a turtle came back up, rescued her. This was a very old and wise turtle. And this old wise turtle had a fondness for people, especially children, children of all different species, human children included. Well, the turtle came back up and said, you learned your lesson. Do not do what I do not tell you to do. Follow the directions and listen well. Well, Sure enough, a little while later, he looked out into the far away and said, oh, I think I see land. The turtle looked and said, oh no, that is a sea demon. You must hide. So, hide underneath me. Hold on, but hide. So Tina, Tina took a deep breath. The sea demon came up close to the turtle. Oh, I smell human. Give me that human to eat. And the turtle said, oh no. No human around here. I think you must be smelling something else. Sure enough, she escaped by hiding under the water and the sea demon was still there. She swam far away, came up just a little bit behind, way behind the sea demon, took a deep breath, and went back down underwater and swam underwater. And finally, the sea demon gave up and went away. Well, then sure enough, the turtle was tired after a while and they did find some land turtle said, ah, we'll go to the island over there and have a rest. Put some banana leaves down for me to rest on. I will rest here. And then we'll continue on our journey looking for your family's things. Well, the little girl wasn't so sleepy, so she went and explored the island a little while. She found in the island a little grass hut. And without even asking permission, she walked right into the hut. Inside the hut lived an evil magician. And this magician grabbed a hold of Hina and said, Ah, now I have a little captive. And she would not allow her to leave, tied her up, put her in a little cage and made of uh, reeds and wood and told her she could only eat grass and ashes and be his servant. Because she was unique and had only one leg. He thought that the people would respect him more. Well, she was trapped there. 
The sea turtle gave up. She never returned, went back to the ocean. Well, the little girl was captive for a long, long time with a bad magician. And all the people respected him and were afraid of him. And, but her brother, back far away in their home island, her brother thought, you know, I must go after her. My little sister, Hina, has disappeared. I think I'll try to go and find her. So he took his sharpest axe, stone axe, and went and carved a bird, a wooden bird, and made it so it could fly. So he crawled inside the bird, and he flew off over the ocean, out and explored all the neighbor islands to look for his dear sister. Well, finally he arrived at the, this island that looked like a fist sticking out of the ocean. And that is where the magician had Hina captive. He arrived there and he landed near the magician. He saw that Hina was trapped there. Right away the magician saw, oh, an amazing wooden, what an amazing bird. I would like to keep this bird too. So he trapped the, captured the bird and then he started worrying right away, how am I going to feed such a big bird? So he sent the people off to the ocean, go fetch some tuna. Go catch some tunas. And bring them back for my bird. The people were afraid and so they went out. But then the bird snuck over to Hina and said, it's me, it's me inside the bird, your brother. Come, jump inside. So he he had climbed inside the wooden bird also, and they took off and flew out over the ocean where the fishermen were fishing for tunas for them. And the magician was with them out in the boats. He said, oh, there's the bird. Throw some tuna, quick, throw some tuna to him, quick. So they threw the tunas up in the air, and they caught all the tunas, and they kept on flying, and rescued Hina all together down back to their home island, and were safe and sound. But that wasn't enough for the brother. He wanted to punish the bad magician for taking away his dear sister. So he flew back to the island, and there he locked up the magician into a little grass hut so that he might feel the same as he made his sister feel. So it was, and so it is, and so it shall be. That is the story of Hina and the Wooden Bird, coming from uh, island culture far to the south of us, amongst all the thousands and thousands and thousands of little islands that are down there in Polynesia area. All right. Well, I uh, think that I will read you a little bit of the uh, Tiptoes book. Even though I don't like to put one story on top of another, but I'm going to because it's still early enough to read a little bit, and uh, I'm going to go back to let's see go back to the alphabet book here and we were reading uh, some of us heard the story uh, the tiptoes lightly story that started out called Lucy Goose and the half egg and I'll have to finish that at some point because Lucy Goose had three and a half eggs it was very strange one round egg that she found in the mud she kept it for herself and no one knows where that egg came from or why what's in it so but this however is J is for mouse so that doesn't make a very sense does it but very much sense but J Jeremy is the name of the little mouse in the tiptoe stories this is called the alphabet by Reg down and uh, pinecone and pepper pot were in a funk in a funk that means they were in a bad mood didn't they? they were sitting inside their house underneath the pine tree they had on their, they had their red hats off and were tugging at their beards. Uh, tugging at their beards. Is that it? Yeah. So, I think, I can't think of anything for letter J, said Pinecone. Me neither, said Pepperpot. I've thought of jackets and jigsaws and j jeans, said Pinecone, and, and jellyfish and jackals too. And I've thought of jabberwockies and junipers and jumping jack in the boxes said Pepper Pot, sighing. But they're no good. We found nothing, nothing at all. Nothing, completely nothing, said Pine, agreed Pinecone with a long face. No, nothing of nothing, nothings. 
we'll just have to draw the letter J. Grown Pepper Pot, that's no fun. And Juneberry already knows the letter J because it's in her name. Oh, no, I hadn't thought of that, Pinecone said gloomily. That makes it a hundred times as bad. The gnomes slowly put on their hats and boots. They dragged their feet towards Farmer John's house. They were not happy. Not happy at all. They were in such a gloomy mood that their hats turned gray and not a single sparkle came off the tips. As they passed the great oak tree, Tiptoes waved from her house. Yoo-hoo, she called. Where are you off to, Master Gnomes, and why are you looking so glum? We're off to teach June and Tom the letter J, sighed Pinecone, but we can't think of anything that works well. Not a single solitary thing. It's an immense disaster. As he spoke, his red boots turned gloomy gray. It's more than a disaster, said Pepperpot. It's a catastrophe, a massive, monstrous catastrophe of mammoth proportions. His red boots turned gray, too. Wait there, said Tiptoes. I'll get the children. Maybe we can fix this. And off she flew. A few minutes later, Tom and June ran out of the house and through the garden. They climbed into the, they climbed the stile, that means a, tent, a fence, as you remember, into the meadow and skipped down to the oak tree with Tiptoes flying beside them. There you are, said Tom, stopping suddenly and staring at the gnomes. By now, they'd turned gray completely. From head to foot, they were gray. Tiptoes said you're ready to teach us the letter J, but you look awful. What's wrong? We can't think of anything to teach the letter J, said Pepperpot. We've racked our brains for hours and hours and hours, and all we can draw, do is draw the letter for you. And that's so, that's so boring. And June Barrett already knows it because it's in her name. <clears throat> but the letter J is easy, said Tiptoes. J is for joy. You can't draw joy. No one can draw joy, said Pinecone. It's impossible. It can never be done. Never, never, never. Yes, you can, said Tiptoes. Just jump in the air and throw your arms, throw out your arms and shout with joy. The gnomes shook their heads. It can't be done, they grumped. No, no, no. Of course it can, said Tiptoes, but you have to do it happily or it won't work. You have to shake the moody wordy woodies out of your hats first. We don't want to said the gnomes, their mouth turning down and their heads hanging. Please try, said Juneberry. Pepperpot, you do it first. I suppose, grumbled Pepperpot, and I'll try if I have to. He took off his hat and began to shake it. He started slowly, but got faster and faster. The faster he shook it, the brighter it and redder the hat became, and the tip began to sparkle. Then his jacket, pants, and boots lost their gray. Finally, all of him was filled with color again. And uh, he leaped into the air. Yippee! He shouted for joy. He looked so funny that Tom and June grinned from ear to ear. I don't see no J, said Pinecone gruffly. This isn't funny. This is mumbo jumbo. Pinecone was still in the dumps. The letter happens quickly, said Juneberry. Said Tiptoes, it's quick. So quickly, it's hard to see. She thought for a moment, then brightened. I know. Jump again, Pepperpot. Pepperpot crouched down, took a huge jump for joy in the air, and cried, Yahoo! <clears throat> Instantly, Tiptoes clapped her hands and cried, Time freeze, Pepperpot, please. Time freeze for Pepperpot, please. Pepperpot froze in midair. His arms opened wide and his legs bent behind him. Hey, let me down, he cried as the children burst out laughing. Even Pinecone grinned and his cap began to sparkle and turn red again. Oh, look, said Juneberry, pointing. There's the letter J, I see. She showed Tom the shape. The children carefully drew Pepperpot into their books. Tom wrote the letter J beside him, inside him, and Juneberry put her letter to her J beside him. Pinecone's bad mood disappeared completely. He walked around Pepperpot, frozen in midair, and examined him. You look lovely, Mr. Pot, he said. Very nice boots, but they need a polish. And your fingernails need a clean icy. And your beard's a little messy. You should comb it more often. He plucked a piece of feathery grass and tickled Pepperpot's nose. Pepperpot struggled to move, but Tiptoe's magic held him firmly in place. Achoo, he sneezed. Achoo, achoo. Finally, Tiptoes let Pepperpot down. 
She cried, time flows as Pepperpot knows. Pepperpot dropped to the ground. It caught him by surprise and he tumbled head over heels in the grass. Up he jumped <clears throat> and chased Pinecone around the field. He wanted to tickle his nose and make him sneeze too, but never caught him. Tom and June watched them and chuckled. Can you freeze me in midair like Pepper Pot? Tom asked Tiptoes. I don't think so, she said. You're much too heavy. Just then, Juneberry called out, Oh, look, a field mouse. A small field mouse appeared from under the roots of a great oak tree. He wasn't afraid of them at all. The gnomes came running back to see what was happening. It's Jeremy Mouse, they cried, stroking his ears and back. Jeremy Mouse had heard all the chatter and wondered what was going on. Normally, he was much too shy to let himself be seen by people, but he knew Tom and June wouldn't hurt him, <clears throat> so he came out. Uh, is that the mouse we saved from Tiger Cat a while ago, said Juneberry? That's him, said Tiptoes. I was trying to have my afternoon nap, said Jeremy Mouse, but there was too much chatter out here. What's all the noise about? We're teaching Tom and June their letters, said Pinecone. We couldn't think of anything that looked like the J, so Tiptoes is helping us. You gnomes are such silly, said Jeremy Mouse. The letter J is easy. That's how my name starts. Watch me. He scurried to a branch that had fallen from the oak tree. He slipped, stopped, and dropped his tail in a curve. There, he said, twitching his whiskers proudly, J is for Jeremy Mouse, and that's me. All right, very good. We will resume again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a good day.